I was 25 years old. I was halfway to becoming a doctor and I was living in the beautiful city of Gold Coast in Australia. Life was good. On the very last Sunday evening of that month, I went to visit my parents. It was a two hour drive that I did all the time. It had been raining, which is not unusual for that time of the year. But I was a confident driver and the road was smooth. I always listen to music, no matter what I do, and this drive was no different. And I played some rap music through my stereo. In a second, everything changed. I think I hit a water puddle and my car began to slide all over the road. I lost control. I was terrified. The car went up an embankment and it came back down and the nose slammed into the tarmac. And my car began to fly through the air, nose to tail. When it finally landed, my life had changed forever. I never grew up wanting to be a doctor. In fact, I started out in law school and I realized pretty quickly that it just wasn't me. It didn't spark a passion. But at that age, I didn't really know myself well enough to know what I was passionate about. I did a lot of soul searching. And then I thought, you know what? I want to find some meaning in my life by helping people. And that is what led me to medicine. So, with a renewed energy, I finished law school. I sat the medical school entrance test. I passed an interview and I got into postgraduate medicine. From day one, I knew that I'd found my calling. But a puddle of water on a highway that night changed the trajectory of my life permanently. When the car finally stopped rolling and the destruction ended, I looked around. My things were scattered all over the road. My white t-shirt was red with blood. But then I realized the worst thing. I tried to get out of the car and I couldn't move. I couldn't feel my legs and my fingers weren't obeying my command because I knew what had happened. I damaged my spinal cord and I'd become paralyzed. The rest of it was a haze. The accident site became a hive of activity and blue and red lights flashed and I was cut out of the car. When I was in the ambulance, I had so many emotions but in, in amongst the pain and the confusion and the fear, I thought, will I ever become a doctor now? And this thought came in waves and it twisted away like a knife in my chest. I spent seven months in hospital and four more years putting my life back together. Every single day, I thought about going back to medical school. And this was despite people telling me that it's just a pipe dream now. It's no longer possible. Fortunately, the educators at my university were great. For five years, they gently poked and prodded me and encouraged me to come back and give it a try. And their belief in me made me believe that maybe this is possible. So I took a giant leap of faith, a very scary one, and I started back. Before I officially started, I spent an intensive couple of weeks just relearning how to do the basics. And I mean the basics, like learning to hold a stethoscope, learning to examine a patient, and just learning how to get around in a hospital environment again. I had to find new and adaptive ways of doing things like putting in sutures with a bit of help or 
getting a needle in for a drip. I remember spending hours with this ICU nurse that used to teach at our medical school. And we finally figured out a way to get a needle in with my fingers that no longer work and successfully place it on a patient. This is a simple task that doctors and nurses do every single day. But for me, it was such a giant step. When I formally came back to medical school, I did the same rotations and activities as everyone else. There were some modifications, like in my practical exams, there were some procedures where I'd guide someone through it rather than doing it myself. The written exams were exactly the same, but I'd do it on a computer. And this was all done with external observers watching me the whole time. There were a lot of eyes on me, but this is how I wanted it. I wanted my degree to be credible and as robust as everyone else's. But medical school isn't easy, and it's not meant to be. But when you add a spinal cord injury into the mix, it becomes a little bit more challenging. When you look at me, you might see the obvious mobility issues, the physical paralysis. But the physical problems in a spinal cord injury go a lot deeper. Everything from my cardiovascular system to my digestive system is affected. My lungs don't work as well as they used to. My skin doesn't respond to temperature changes anymore. So I'm like a lizard. From a lifestyle perspective, everything takes a lot longer. If I have to be somewhere in the morning, I sometimes have to get up three to four hours before I need to be there. So this was life for me after the spinal cord injury. If medical school started at 7 a.m., I got up at 3.30 a.m. I went to the hospital, I did my time as a medical student, and then I went to the library, and I studied until the last tram came. I went home and I fell into bed exhausted. I did this six days a week, day in, day out, until I passed my exams. I didn't just want to scrape by. So I took the opportunity to go to Boston and I did a clerkship at the Harvard University. I got a distinction with honors there. <laughs> After two very long years of post-accident study, I finally graduated medical school with awards for excellence. And this was made possible with my mum, who was there every single day. After thinking at one point that I might never be able to become a doctor, it wasn't until I went across that stage that I realized that I'd made it. After I graduated, I was promptly registered as a doctor with my other colleagues. But there was one other step, and that was getting a job. I wasn't too worried, though, because every domestic graduating doctor in Australia is guaranteed a job. So, my friends got their job offers a couple of months later. But me, I got a letter. And the letter said that my application had been pulled because I have a spinal cord injury. The health authority that employs doctors told me that it would take a few weeks for them to figure out what to do with me. But the weeks turned into months. And as the months went on, I started asking a lot of questions. What's happening? How long will this take? It quickly became apparent to me that every domestic doctor gets a job unless you have a physical disability. So me getting a job wasn't contingent on my grades or my merits or my degree. It depended on the spinal cord injury. I told them about some scattered stories of doctors around the world practicing with various disabilities and having successful careers. They told me that it didn't matter. I never thought that my law degree would come in handy at a time like this. <laughs> so I started looking at the law, but what I found scared me because the law wasn't on my side. 
I read cases of doctors and nurses that were treated unfairly. They weren't able to progress their careers after suffering an injury. The law didn't back them up. How was I going to win this battle when I hadn't even started my career? Fortunately, I had a great community behind me. I had friends, advocates, family, politicians, and the media who all rallied around me, and they fought. They advocated for me publicly and privately, behind the scenes. They wanted me to get a job based on my merit, and they didn't want me to stop because I had a disability. And that is what got us the win. I got a job offer two days before everyone started work. It's funny because that health authority told me that I wouldn't be starting work with everyone else. But it was last minute and I did. Work has been amazing. I've loved every single minute of it. I've worked in emergency, surgery, internal medicine, obstetrics and gynecology. And in my first year, along with some of my very talented colleagues, I got nominated for an Intern of the Year Award. And that was really special for me because at one point, I didn't even know if I could make it. After I came back to medical school, the rules for students entering medical school with disabilities got even tighter. Medical schools adopted some prescriptive physical and emotional guidelines. If I were to apply for medical school today, there's a good chance that I might not get in. I work every single day. I engage in research and search for a solution that might one day cure spinal cord injury. I use my brain every day because medicine is an intellectual activity. Not all doctors perform surgery. Not all doctors perform resuscitations. But every single doctor is required to exercise their intellect. I believe that people with a disability have a role to play that is far beyond that of a patient in our healthcare system. I believe that the solutions to our most complex problems will come from having a diversity of perspectives, not more of the same. The problem is complex because there are barriers to people with disability seeking a career in medicine at every step of a doctor's journey. We need to look at ways in admitting people to medical school who have a disability. We need to look at ways of getting them through medical school successfully. And we need to look at ways of getting them into specialist training. That's really important because when I came back to medical school, I thought really deep about what specialty I should pursue. And I thought radiology might be the good choice. That's why I went to Harvard and I did my clerkship in radiology quite successfully. But when I came back to my hospital and talked to the leaders of the radiology department about it, they were very dismissive. They asked me a lot of questions about my physical capability. Even though I'd worked in the emergency department for six months, they wanted me to get an occupational therapy assessment. Can you even type, they once asked. Well, I can actually, most likely faster than any of them. When I told this to one of the senior doctors, Overlooking the junior doctors, they said, well, considering your physical capacity, you probably do need to find a non-clinical specialty. Fortunately, this view wasn't shared by everyone. I was talking about my experience with one of the emergency doctors, a very highly respected specialist. She told me, you've always loved emergency medicine, haven't you? Why don't you give that a try? We'd support you. And true to their word, they've been one of the most supportive groups that I've come across. So disability is a social construct. I've never felt disabled. In fact, I feel like I've achieved more after my accident than before. And these interactions are really important because it shows us that it's not physical capacity that threatens to stop people. It's people's attitudes. A puddle of water on a highway caused an accident and it changed my life forever. But it wasn't the accident that threatened to stop me from becoming a doctor. 
It isn't my physical capacity that threatens to halt my career. It's the attitude of people towards difference. And that is something we can choose to change today. Thank you.